Civil Society. Uh, we're putting on this event tonight in conjunction with Mozilla. Thanks to Mozilla for helping us put this on, and thanks to New America for hosting us this evening. Um, I'm about to introduce uh, our opening remarks, but first, just to, to set expectations for the evening, we're going to start off our with opening remarks for about 10 or 15 minutes, go into our panel discussion, and then we have a hard stop at about 7.15 or 7.20 uh, so that folks who want to go watch baseball uh, can get away and watch baseball. If you have time to stay and uh, do a Q&A with us, we'll also be taking questions um, after we wrap up the formal panel. Um, but before we get to the panel, I want to introduce my colleague at CIS, uh, the Honorable Stephen W. Smith, now a retired federal magistrate judge uh, from Houston, uh, who will be giving some opening remarks. Um, and take it away, Steve. All right. <coughs> Thank you, Rihanna. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to Mozilla. Also, I uh, have to uh, acknowledge that uh, there's some support here from the Mark Carther Foundation, uh, providing a little financial support, so we really appreciate that. We have a terrific lineup of speakers. Uh, can't wait to hear what they have to say. Uh, and so I'm going to try to keep my mar remarks pretty brief. Um, I think my role here is really uh, more of a table setter than anything else. Carpenter was a long-awaited decision for, for everybody, uh, especially for me. Uh, I took the bench in 2004. Uh, one of the very first opinions I ever published in FedSup was um, on CSLI uh, in 2005. <coughs> that opinion was basically a cry for help, uh, a plea for guidance from uh, the powers that be. Uh, I was grateful to finally get that guidance in June of 2018 one month before I retired. Uh, so better late than never, I suppose. Uh, though now that we finally have an answer, at least with regard to certain types of historical cell site data uh, and the Fourth Amendment protections, what, is, what does Carpenter really mean? Um, kind of reminds me of that great Douglas Adams novel, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know, people ask deep thought computer. Uh, what the answer to the great question of life, the universe, and everything was. And uh, after seven and a half million years of computation, the answer came back 42. Okay. Uh, audience was a little puzzled, and computer said, no, that is definitely the right answer. You just hadn't figured out the right questions. Um, so has Carpenter finally you know, answered these questions? Has it finally bridged the gap between the 18th century constitution and 21st century technology? Is it the key to life, the universe, and everything under the Fourth Amendment? Uh, or is it only raised more questions than it answered? And will we have to wait another seven and a half million years to figure out the answers? So brings us to our topic today. Uh, is Carpenter unemployed? Uh, obviously, one way to approach this is to take a look at reported lower court decisions. Uh, I want to keep in mind, I mean, this is the way we've did it t tonight, and I'm going to get into the, uh, the presentation that, that um, one of our law students prepared. It's not the best way, I, well, it's not the only way to measure the impact of Carpenter's real impact for reasons I'll get into uh, at, at the close here. Um, Anyway, we asked one of our brilliant Stanford Law School students, Tyler Jones, to uh, the CIS intern, to track the published decisions, every published decision, state or federal, that cited Carpenter um, uh, over the year. And, and he prepared a spreadsheet. There were something like 360 some odd cases. Uh, he read them all, organized them, uh, put them into a spreadsheet. And, and then prepared a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation that basically summarized his findings. Now, and, and that's what I'm getting ready to, to walk through with you here. Um, he present, this is not the first time this spreadsheet has been presented. He presented it at last month's warrant workshop at at Stanford that we put on for federal magistrate judges. We had 60 magistrate judges from around the country. The topic was uh, digital search and surveillance. Uh, and we had uh, uh, Paul Ohm here was the uh, uh, gracious enough to appear as our uh, closing speaker there. Uh, two and a half day, very intense workshop. Uh, Tyler Jones gave this talk during lunch of the second day. 
uh, very well received by all the master judges. In fact, the first question Tyler got after he finished was, do you have a job after graduation? Uh, so I know good work when I see it, so I'll happily plagiarize it for you here tonight. I'm gonna walk through it uh, quickly. Um, the, um, just basically uh, the outline. One, one thing I'll note, Carpenter, or Tyler used the term settled law versus largely settled or unsettled. It, what he meant was not that the body of law is settled, it's just that the cases that he saw during the year either agreed or were disagreeing with each other or, or, um, uh, or maybe largely agreed with one another. Uh, the, um, it basically what he found was, was really rather unsurprising. Um, I think you all know what Carpenter Hill, I won't go over that. Um, basically, in terms of traditional third-party doctrine applications like customer subscriber information, uh, IP address, bank records, phone call records, those, those things were not protected before Carpenter and they're still not protected. That's, that core of the third-party doctrine is still, still in place. Um, the cases dealing with exigency, the you know, special circumstances where you've got uh, someone um, about to be murdered or you have a, uh, a, a child kidnapping or something like that. Those circumstances, there's not gonna be a warrant requirement. Carpenter didn't, didn't change that. Carpenter said it didn't change that and, and the cases that, that Tyler found bore that out. The, the really first area of, I think, large agreement among the reported decisions is that there's really no, no quantitative, no qualitative difference between historical cell site information and prospective or real-time cell site information, location information. I mean, where you've been over the last seven days is really no different in terms of the Fourth Amendment protection than where you're going in the next seven days. And, and most of the course, courts have, have borne that out. Now, the question becomes, okay, what about the, uh, where the real-time surveillance is less than seven days? Uh, and again, we're gonna, you're gonna see some variation there. Uh, I think what, what Tyler found was that, uh, well, the, the variation in this didn't really, <coughs> didn't really happen until the surveillance was one or two days or less. Three or four days, the court seemed to be saying, okay, uh, Carpenter applies. Um, less than that, uh, room for disagreement. Um, I, I'm moving through these real quickly because uh, actually we could probably make this, I don't know if we could make this available or not to the attendees, but uh, if you're interested. Um, the first area or the area that there was, I want to say, um, video surveillance, I'm not sure about that one. Um, I think the, there was disagreement, well, most of the cases that he found on video surveillance um, found that a warrant was not required. I think this is a little problematic. I think that uh, the cases that, that came up during this year were pole cameras that were set up in commercial venues or uh, a shopping center or outside a store or something, a public setting. Uh, most of those cases I don't think involved, although some of them per apparently did, most of them did not involve uh, 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 poll camera set up to, to observe a home or areas around a home over a period of time. Uh, I think I would disagree with, with the characterization there that that was largely settled. I don't think that, I think that was an unsettled area. Um, the, um, um, we do have the wrong, uh, well, uh, I'll move on. St there were standing issues here that, um, um, well, I don't think really uh, Carter delved in, or Tyler delved into that I don't think really uh, are tied to Carpenter. Stan a lot of the cases that he saw were cases trying to decide whether or not the, the defendant had a property interest in the phone uh, or, or, or a reasonable expectation of, the, of privacy and the movements of a phone that would belong to somebody else. 
Uh, so a lot of the cases that Carter, that Tyler flagged, dealt with standing, which I don't think is really s something we need to spend much time on. Um, unsettled, another unsettled area was the stingrays. Um, again, um, I think primarily that the primary distinction here, the cases that required warrants, are cases that the sting where the stingray was used to track or locate uh, a particular phone. Uh, the cases that did not require warrant uh, are cases in which the Stingray was simply trying to find a phone number as opposed to location. Although, again, I think one of those cases doesn't fit that dichotomy. But I think uh, in any event, that, that's another unsettled area after, uh, after Carpenter. Although, interestingly, I think the, the DOJ policy is to get a warrant whenever they use a, a Stingray, as, as far as I, I'm, at least that was my experience. Um, Duration of surveillance, again, that's another unsettled area. If you get down to two days or less, uh, courts are having difficulty trying to decide which way to go, um, whether it's protected or not. Um, all right. Okay. Um, now, there were some other points that Tyler made uh, in the presentation, and uh, just in general, he, he seemed to, to, his conclusion was that state courts seem to be more willing to expand on Carpenter than federal courts. Federal courts seem to be a little more cautious. Um, there were a ton of Leon good faith cases, uh, that sort of thing, that uh, uh, where courts were uh, using the good faith doctrine to avoid ruling on the constitutional questions. Uh, but, uh, the, and again, as we saw, there are a lot of cases resolved on standing grounds, which I don't think really necessarily implicates much in the way of Fourth Amendment doctrine. Uh, all right, at this point, uh, I'm going to just flag some of the interesting cases dealing with non-locational databases that I think uh, came up in, in Tyler's search. Uh, three particular topics in, in particular, uh, there, there's not a slide on these, but uh, the first area that I think is very interesting is, is medical records, which has always struck me as uh, an area that um, would be the next, next move uh, for a court moving, extending Carpenter beyond location databases. Uh, most everyone, it seems to me, um, feels they have a reasonable expectation of privacy in their medical records, even though they're in the hands of their doctor or their provider. Uh, we got statutory protection for those things. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, there was a, a couple of cases in the database or in the spreadsheet uh, going different ways on this. There was a case out of the Northern District of Illinois involving psychotherapy records held in the hands of the psychotherapist. Uh, and that court found, yes, there's a Fourth Amendment protection there and third party doctrine doesn't apply. An interesting case out of New Hampshire went the other way in a case involving prescription drug databases that are maintained by state health agencies. Uh, New Hampshire has a requirement that any provider provide uh, copies of uh, prescription records uh, to any patient that they, uh, they issue, and there's maintained their database. Law enforcement was trying to investigate a Medicare fraud. They sent a subpoena to the state agency asking to get uh, those records. State law required that, it, that there be a, uh, they only be accessed via a warrant. Uh, of course, uh, this is in federal court and uh, the uh, uh, government argued, well, state law is preempted here. Uh, there's, a, there's express federal statute allowing prosecutors to get uh, pr medical records if they're investigating a drug crime, drug related crime, uh, via subpoena and the district the magistrate judge there found the Fourth Amendment did not apply, did not cover Carpenter, didn't apply um, in that situation. I think that's a surprising result. I'd be surprised if that uh, ultimately held up uh, down the line. Uh, next interesting topic, an area that may be percolating up to the appellate courts is event data recorders on automobiles. I'm sure most of you are aware, I wasn't until I read this case, of these cases. Your automobile has something akin to a black box. If there's a crash, 
It records data about the vehicle's operation immediately before the crash, during and after, speed of the vehicle, whether the brakes were engaged, uh, airbags were engaged, whether the, you, you had your seat belts buckled, and other information about the, the, uh, the passengers in the car. Uh, two decisions, one out of Georgia, one out of Florida, directly contradict one another. The Florida case is the earlier case. Actually, it was decided prior to Carpenter. It said third-party doctrine, uh, well, third-party doctrine wouldn't apply here. There's Fourth Amendment uh, protection to this data, uh, and you have to get a warrant. Uh, Georgia Court of Appeals said, almost the exact same factual circumstance, uh, said no, a warrant's not required. Uh, that case is now on appeal to the Georgia Supreme Court. Rihanna assisted in an amicus brief uh, arguing that case. Uh, interesting twist in that case for you Justice Gorsuch fans. Um, there is a viable argument in that case, a property-based argument, uh, supporting the, the defendants uh, based on the Federal Driver Privacy Act of 2015, which expressly says any data retained by an event data recorder is the property of the owner or lessee of the motor vehicle. Uh, so that seemed to be relevant to the Florida Supreme Court or Florida Court of Appeals. Georgia Court of Appeals blew that off. So uh, anyway, that, that seems to be a, a, a coming issue that, that may be um, headed for resolution soon. Uh, the final interesting topic or interesting non-locational databases are uh, smart meters. Uh, I think most of us are aware that utilities, your utilities to your homes are now being monitored by a so-called smart meter which enables the local utility to uh, access and collect your uh, energy uh, consumption on 15-minute intervals during the day. Uh, in it's a Seventh Circuit case in the city of Naperville, uh, citizens uh, contested that uh, practice, said that was, uh, they had a Fourth Amendment uh, right of protection uh, uh, for this data and that it was a search for the municipality to get this information as often as it did. Uh, the Seventh Circuit said, yes, it is a search. Yes, it is protected by the Fourth Amendment. No warrant requirement, obviously. So you're into the balancing test, uh, court found on balance. Uh, the government has a sufficient competing, compelling interest to get that information. Court expressly said, though, if there may be a different result if law enforcement is attempting to access the municipal database uh, for investigative purposes. So that's one uh, interesting, uh, that something that obviously is going to be um, uh, uh, a topic going forward. Um, okay, one more comment uh, here, and then I'll, I'll sit down and we'll listen to people have. Uh, really interesting opinions to uh, to share. I, I think there, there are caveats about any survey like this. Uh, the first is most magistrate judges don't write opinions. Uh, they're busy. They don't write opinions on search warrants, just, you know, especially. Uh, and state court judges, state court criminal judges and magistrates who do the great bulk of search warrant issuance in this country never write opinions, at least as far as I'm aware. Maybe there's, there are somewhere, but they're generally not reported at all. So you don't know whether the, what you're getting by a published opinion is representative of the entire sample or, or, or uh, shared by other um, non-writing magistrate judges. Second point, judge shopping is a fact of life on the warrant docket. Any large city that has, like Houston had, we had five magistrate judges on duty, had a regular uh, criminal duty assignment. Uh, the prosecutors knew when I was on duty, and they, if they didn't want me, they could wait two weeks and get the next, and you know, and so on and so on down the line. Uh, it's just a fact of life. And I th a couple of months ago, my good friend Jamie Ornstein, master judge in Brooklyn, wrote a New York Times op-ed describing the practice, talking about sitting in his office on criminal duty with nothing to do, twiddling his thumbs, and and pointing out this this has uh, an impact on the shape of Fourth Amendment law because prosecutors can go to the judges that you know, are going to give them a, favor, a, a, a good hearing. And who can blame them? You know, it's just, that's just the way our system is. Uh, final thing is, you know, obviously the warrant docket would be the best place to go to get evidence on Carter's, Carpenter's impact. 
we don't know, and it's interesting to question to, to ponder, this carpenter now requiring a warrant, does that mean that there are going to be more search warrants uh, uh, sought and obtained? Or are they going to be, is, is law enforcement going to be discouraged because, oh, it takes too long to prepare search warrants, so there's going to be no effect or, or less number of search warrants? Um, and, or even if there are more search warrants, are there going to be less D orders? Or is a law enforcement agent simply going to cut out a paragraph from his, his 2703D application and paste it into his search warrant affidavit, and voila, uh, he's got a search warrant uh, and with no additional work. And if that's the case, and really you haven't diminished the total number of, of searches of cell phone records as a result of Carpenter, is Carpenter such a privacy-enhancing result? You know, if uh, the the intrusion in our digital lives is the same, okay. Till we get a regular and uniform court data about search warrants, like we have on on uh, wiretaps, uh, we are going to have to most heavily rely on the considered opinions of experts in the field. Luckily, we have assembled some of the best in the field tonight, and so at this point, I'm going to turn the turn the microphone over. To them, and I'm not sure who goes first, Rihanna, or you, Rihanna. Yeah, I can go well, I like this informal setup. I think it helps make it a little more. Uh, uh, you're missing. You're missing David. Ah, oh, okay, you great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks everybody again for joining us this evening. Um, I wanted to start off very quickly by introducing our panelists. You have their bios in the sheet that I handed out that recites the tales of their wonderful accomplishments and, and heroic feats, um, so there's no need to recount them here. Um, but I'm going to introduce everybody and then I'll ask each of you just for your quick response, both your thoughts on, on Carpenter, looking back now over the last 15 months, and, and what you think, especially in light of uh, Judge Smith's introductory remarks. So next to me, uh, I have David Gray, who's a professor at the University of Maryland. Next to him is Jumana Musa from the National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys, which leads the Fourth Amendment Center there. Um, Paul Ohm from Georgetown University. Paul Rosenzweig, who for purposes of disambiguation, I'm going to refer to as Rosie this evening <laughs> at his request from the R Street Institute. And finally, last but not least, we have Mark Zollinger uh, from the law firm in Zuljan. So Dave, all you. Uh, so thanks very much, Your Honor, for this amazing spreadsheet, um, which is going to make the next year of my life a lot easier. Uh, and I'll, I'll actually pick up a thread that you left behind and one that you discarded. So one of the things that was left on the floor for the government and Carpenter, I think, was just to lay down on the search issue and hold the bastion or hold the wall, or hold the, uh, maintain a border at the remedy question. Um, in particular, argue that maybe D orders are constitutionally sufficient for cell site location information. Uh, maybe that wouldn't have been a winner, but it would have been a very interesting argument uh, for some of the reasons that you just brought up at the end of your, of your comments. And that is that as we enter a world where there is a greater diversity of means to conduct searches and our different levels of intrusion on privacy or different capacities to for those technologies to fac facilitate programs of broad and indiscriminate surveillance, it seems to me that we're going to have to diversify the universe of prospective Fourth Amendment remedies. We only have one now, which is the warrant requirement. And there's nothing constitutional, constitutionally required about the warrant requirement. The warrant requirement is entirely a creation of the judiciary, and they could create a more diverse range of prospective remedies. They've already done that in the context of stop and frisk, um, for example. And so what if Congress, um, following on the mo failed model of 183501, came in and said, well, we're going to rewrite 2703D, but just put in a, per a particularity requirement. And we're going to make it specific to cell site location information. So going forward by congressional mandate, law enforcement officers can get cell site location information, retrospective or real time, 
um, if they can show that it is relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation, um, that they've taken minimal steps to exhaust alternatives, and they're asking for a reasonably constrained universe of locations uh, in terms of duration or particular or identified locations. It's, it seems to me that that would be perfectly constitutional, and that would be a really interesting conversation that we haven't seen yet. Um, and maybe we will, um, particularly if it becomes clear that the imposing the warrant requirement hasn't really changed much of anything um, except to, for, to, to force officers to do what they were already doing um, under the niceties of 2703D. Uh, and then the second point that, uh, that you discard was the one of standing. And I think the two are closely interrelated because as I'm looking at the spreadsheet, there's a lot of standing cases here. Um, and only one of which that I saw where somebody who wasn't the owner of the phone was granted standing. And that was a circumstance when there were a bunch of people in a car for eight days and they were, cops were, traffic, were tracking one cell phone. And the court said, okay, well, everybody in the car had standing to challenge that, that tracking. But for all the other circumstances, um, there wa it was very clear that courts weren't going to extend standing to challenge a, a, a course of surveillance um, if you didn't own the phone uh, and or maybe if you had the phone on your person. And that is reverting to a theory of standing that I think is in jeopardy after Carpenter. And that's less apparent in the majority opinion than it is in the two dissenting opinions, one by Kennedy and one by Justice Thomas, where both of them go out of their way to say, what we're real, one of the things that really concerns us here is that somebody who's not the owner of the records is given standing to challenge a search of those records. And if anything is fundamental about our Fourth Amendment law, it's that you can't challenge a search unless it's a search of you or a search of your property, a search of, uh, of your papers. Um, and that's something that is that the Chief Justice doesn't respond to. Um, and I, it strikes me that he didn't respond to that because he didn't have a particularly good response. That's just something that he glides over in the majority opinion. And that's something that it seems to me we're going to have to ask serious questions about going forward. Um, and it links back to the remedies question because the other Fourth Amendment remedy is the exclusionary rule. And so all of these cases are seen through the lens of the exclusionary rule. But if we had a more diverse range of remedies for Fourth Amendment violations, um, then maybe we'd be more willing to recognize a broader notion of standing, a broader group of individuals who could challenge police practices and seek the kinds of prospective remedies that would provide security to each of us and all of us that we're not being subject to threats of constant and unjustified surveillance. Sorry, was that overlong? I'm sorry for that. It's a good way to kick us off. Jumaan, you want to respond to that? Uh, sure. And that was, I also have to actually agree, this spreadsheet is phenomenal. Like, we've tried an informal tracking. It's nowhere near this. And it's, it's you have to, I'm sure not everybody will be as excited as some of us, but like for the legal nerds in us, uh, it, it was great. Um, as was your article, Paul, which I'm sure you were going to talk about. Uh, I might bring it up. <laughs> but, you know, it just, Coming off of a couple things you said, I think for us at NACDL, we looked at Carpenter as an opportunity and an encouragement to think wildly creatively about how to challenge these things and what kind of arguments to bring up. Um, you know, I know for Nate Wessler who argued the case, you know, I've seen him go around and speak to people and, you know, the first thing he'll say is whatever you do, raise the property argument. Um, you know, our argument is raise every argument, right? At this point, there's no telling sort of what is going to be the tipping point or the legal theory or the thread that someone decides to unravel and says, you've got something here. Now I know how to take this sort of newish thing and understand it in the context of how I think about the Fourth Amendment or the Constitution or whatever. Um, and so that's sort of what we set out to do is, is to help people make wildly creative arguments um, and think through it broadly. Because you know, when it comes to the question of what can be searched and then what are your remedies, the exclusionary rule is just not a great one. And it's just not a great one because there's always a reason why you get a great decision and then there's a good faith doctrine or inevitable discovery or all these other things that say like, yeah, they shouldn't have done it, but yeah, and then, you know, all the information goes forward anyway. And so, you know, we, like I said, we've thought about this fairly broadly. I think there's a couple of things. Um, it's nice to see the conversation that says get a warrant, right? I think the ACLU has a sticker that says get a warrant. You can slap it on everything. Realistically, and at this stage and phase, it's just not meaningful anymore. 
it's not meaningful because it's really just not that hard to get a warrant, right? And I think it's exactly what you were bringing up. You, know, you get to take the paragraph off, off of this application and put it in that application and someone signs off on it and there you go. And so, and you know, part of it, and I'm glad you all are training judges, is because sometimes it's hard to grasp just how much information is this, you know, this program or this technology or this data mining, you know, system bringing when you say, yeah, go ahead and, and, and you can get all this information with a warrant. So get a warrant, you know, I think at this point it's not sufficient. And so we're in this sort of bind where you have, you know, the Historic Communication Act, which is about a million years old, and Congress, who <laughs> will not do anything about it, I say this as someone who has tried to make them do something about it, um, and, you know, a situation where you do need some legislative action, and you see that not just in Carpenter, but in other cases where they say, hey, Congress, you all should be, you know, thinking about these things. Um, and so when it comes to arguing, you know, we, like, like I said, we think about it holistically. So just a few things like, you know, we took the, what we didn't cover in this decision as the roadmap to what we should be challenging, right? So tower dumps, real-time real E911 tracking, real-time stingray tracking, uh, online accounts, modern bank records, right? We still think bank records could and should fall. It's a very different kind of bank record these days than, you know, when people would walk around with their checkbook and their checkbook register. Uh, smart devices, and there's, you know, arguments about that being in the home and maybe other things versus the ones you wear. Um, Geofencing, right? Where they just go say, hey, Google, tell us everybody who is in this area, which is kind of a huge pervasive amount. And there's questions as to how that fits. Um, you know, but we're working to make it fit. And I think one of the things we've seen and that we've tried to do, and we being the Fourth Amendment Center, where we basically are working to create the materials and the trainings and assist defense lawyers in making these arguments, is to get some of those remedies up front. So we were able to intervene in a case that is under seal and will not be named and will not have a lot of details, but where they essentially seized a huge amount of electronic devices, um, you know, computers and otherwise, and downloaded all the information off them and, ready were to, and were ready to search all of them. And intervening early enough that we actually got the decision and it, it sort of was sustained on appeal that they just can't go through everything, right? They just can't. And they have to actually put some limits on it before the search, right? So this is not like once they've gone through everything and you're trying to go backwards and be like, actually, you shouldn't have done that and you shouldn't be able to pay attention to this and that. But to be able to stop it before it happened was fairly significant. And that's sort of like one of the one of the threads of what we're chasing down. I think there's also the question, and I know now I'm sort of like conflating a Riley and Carpenter decision. Riley being, of course, the case where they said no, you know, searching someone's cell phone incident to arrest is not the same as looking in their packet of cigarettes that they had in their pocket. Uh, but you know, one of the things they talked about in Riley was just how comprehensive that information was, how it collected all this information in one place that you legitimately couldn't get otherwise, right? You never would have been able to do this in the past. So it's not just the tiny constables, it's, it's, it's the breadth of all of it. And I think that there's an argument there as well when it comes to questions of, they said, yeah, no, this doesn't count for like surveillance cameras, but what happens when, you know, the surveillance cameras are everywhere and they're pervasive and you have a smart city and it's, you know, linked up with, with license plate readers and maybe face recognition and they can track you throughout the whole city at every point, that should change an analysis, right? It gets that back to that comprehensive kind of surveillance that is more than, you know, you walk by the street corner that had a camera on it, or, you know, you happen to drive over the bridge where instead of paying a toll, they, they just record your license plate and you keep it moving. So I think that there's also, you know, going to be a place where Carpenter and Riley meet to make some of those technologies. They said, yeah, we're not really covering these, and they have to sort of factor in how they get integrated with all the other technologies and how the programs can sort of data mine them all and distill information in a way that they can't currently um, that might take us there. So I think those are sort of my, my first basket of thoughts coming off of your basket of thoughts. Um, so I wonder what it would have been like if we had gotten together in 1968 and we said, here we are a year after this funny cat's opinion. <laughs> um, and maybe, maybe it's an incremental step. Maybe Olmstead is dead. Uh, let's look at all the kind of lower court opinions that have struggled with this. Maybe we wouldn't have even noticed that one of the concurrences had this funny test about reasonable expectations of privacy. Um, so I guess this is a long-winded way of saying it's early days, uh, and although I'm glad that we're having check-ins like this, and let's make it an annual tradition, um, I think I think it's going <laughs> I think it's going to take a lot of time uh, before we really understand the kind of full sweep and import of Carpenter. Um, and and when I was invited onto this panel, the very first thing I said in email was, "You should know that I am way on one side, which is I think Carpenter changes everything." Um, and so I have an article, thank you for, uh, for the, the plug, 
Yeah, the like Many it. Revolutions of Carpenter. So the title says it all. I'm not a kind of dispassionate uh, person when it comes to my opinion about the sweep and breadth of this opinion. I think it's quite likely that in 10 years we'll talk about the pre-Carpenter Katz era and the post-Carpenter era, um, at least when it comes to kind of technologically embedded surveillance. I don't think the REP test is going away anytime soon, although, God, I wish it would. Um, it is a scourge. I think it uh, has had a very, very, very bad run as a kind of protector of civil liberties, and I can't wait till we could just bury it and be done with it. But in the meantime, I think Carpenter, if you really dissect the kind of moves it makes throughout, and I hope during the course of this hour I can, I can bring in lots of little tidbits and examples, um, I, think it's, I think it's possible to defend the argument that this changes fundamental things about how the Supreme Court and ultimately the lower courts think about Fourth Amendment questions. Um, one thing I'll say that will never be reflected, and by the way, great work for a Stanford student. I wish a, a Georgetown student could have tackled it. But uh, <laughs> one thing I will say that a study like that, which is so illuminating, so useful, uh, could never reveal is the kind of creativity that an opinion like Carpenter will squash. Um, and so one thing that observers of the digital Fourth Amendment have been worried about for a long time is an intrepid, creative police detective somewhere realizing that there's this rich database of behavioral information that has never been tapped before. Um, so think any database created by any Internet of Things device. Um, and pre-Carpenter, when we were in a, like, cats is the only analysis world, it would have been really tempting to go to one of these companies, I know Ring has been in the news a lot in the last couple of weeks, to go to one of these companies like Fitbit uh, or you know, one of the Runkeeper apps and, and to say, can you give me access to this rich database of user information? Um, and of course, their first stop, the police detective, would have been the local district attorney. I think post Carpenter, any reasonably good district attorney, assistant district attorney, will throw up red flags and caution signs at that point. I mean, there is just so much language in the opinion uh, that makes it clear that at least Chief Justice Roberts and uh, the four liberal justices uh, fundamentally worry about the effect that technology has uh, in creating these digital dossiers about everything we do. Um, and it's not just Carpenter, it's Riley, it's Jones. We now have this kind of emerging and I think durable majority of the Supreme Court, durable as long as uh, Justice Ginsburg keeps taking her vitamins, um, durable majority of the Supreme Court, that will find that there are certain things about collections of data that give rise to reasonable expectations of privacy or more importantly, the warrant requirement. And so what you'll often have is you'll have, and I, was, I should say I have a long, complicated biography, but part of it was as a prosecutor at the Justice Department. So I can imagine myself as a kind of young prosecutor saying no, Reread Carpenter, you're not going to be able to get this at this stage in the investigation. Uh, you know, 10 points for creativity, but go back, do a little more police work, come back to me when you have probable cause, and we'll get a warrant together. Those will never show up on the spreadsheet, right? We will never know the kind of creative, uh, you know, uh, uh, flights of fancy that Carpenter has now put to bed. And I think those will be significant. I actually think that a lot of what determines our relationship to the police is the state of police tradecraft, right? Is what they have, what they do, um, and what their kind of creativity allows them to imagine. And so I think Carpenter will be a kind of creativity killing machine for the police, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing that's gonna be hard to measure, uh, measure in retrospectives like this. Okay, tons more to say, but that's enough for now. Uh, Rosie, do you agree wholeheartedly, full-throatedly with Paul so, on this? I, I'm I now know why I'm on this panel, <laughs> which is to say um, I, I, almost everything that Paul said is right except for his conclusion that Carpenter is transformative. Okay. I, I, I tend to think of Carpenter as a tale told by a Supreme Court justice s full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And you know, the best way to tell that story is that just a few months ago, Timothy Carpenter's sentence was reaffirmed under the good faith exception and he's going to spend the rest of his life in jail anyway, right? And when I, uh, I, I'm in a think tank, I do half of my time uh, actually doing cases in DC, uh, and I, when I pull my friends in the defense bar and I, and I ask them, uh, had, have you seen any uh, appreciable decrease in the use of uh, cell site 
dumps or reverse dumps or any of the possible things, they mostly say, well, you know, no, not really. Now, that's not data because that's anecdotal, but I don't think there's much to it. And the reason I don't think there's much to it is that it turns so much on uh, what I think of as the unique sensibilities of John Roberts and nothing more. Uh, you know, he goes out of his, I, I reread it just for this, and he uses the word unique seven times, or distinctive, or uh, transformative, or, or, you know, digital uh, uh, absurd. He even goes so far as to call the cell phone almost a part of the human anatomy, right? Which, there's not going to be a lot of other things that reach that level of, of salience, at least in my judgment. And then he goes out of his way to say all the things that this case is not about. Uh, it's not about, for him at least, real-time cell site location. I think the move to that is an easy one and, and is going to always happen. But he even went, but he wasn't even willing to go that far. He says it's not about tower dumps. It's not about uh, Smith and Miller and CCTVs. It's not about foreign or national security interests. It's about none of those things for him. So he, he's deliberately trying to cabinet. And then the, the part of it that makes it so unpromising for me is that Rather than settling on a single ground for decision that might be something that you could build a doctrine about, he trots out seven or eight possibilities. He says sometimes it's about the volume of the data, the frequency of its collection, the length of time of its collection, the sensitive nature of, of what's being collected. Now, that might apply in the health uh, uh, field, but it wouldn't be the volume or the frequency or the or, or necessarily the length of time. He says it's uh, about the unique precision of cell site location information, which is really odd because cell site location information is less precise than GPS tracking data. Uh, but nonetheless, he, he trots that out. He trots out the idea that it's, a, it's forced consent in the sense that you can't live without a phone anymore, so everybody's consenting to this. He try, talks about the lack of opportunity for people to effectively object to the collection. Uh, which you might have in any situation that involves uh, the collection of information from you directly uh, at over length of time, like with your, with, with your doctor, for example. Uh, so in the end, you know, a doctrine that has so many possible uh, grounds really has none, in my judgment. Yeah, I mean, there are very few technologies that are going to meet all seven of those criteria in the end. If he'd picked just one, yeah, you know, I, 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 I've been there arguing that we should adopt a mosaic theory of law and prohibit large-scale collections when it becomes uh, possible to collect enough data to transform your ability to know facts about people. Because that's something that we can measure in data science, and it'll change over time, but that's okay. But it's a kind of hard and, and fast standard. Or seven days, yes, less than seven days, no. I'd be, and, I, and there I don't care whether it's two or three. But Justice Roberts, through so many possible grounds for this decision at us that, in effect, he left it so that the only person who knows what's really, really wrong about historical cell site location uh, collection is him. Uh, and he wrote Riley, and he's the only one who knows why cell phones are different than diaries uh, for the same reason. He just says it feels different. That, to me, is in the long run not a sustainable way of creating doctrine that will guide the police I actually see the opposite. I see police kind of looking at this and being more creative, going to 23andMe for, uh, for DNA data and trying to link that back up to, to people through their ancestors. So even if you haven't given data, if your sister has given data to 23andMe, you're at risk. And they, they look and they say, well, uh, you know, it's not very voluminous, not frequent. And, uh, and so I see this as almost a roadmap to how to uh, increase the collection of data without too much judicial interference. Uh, if I had to predict, it will be limited to uh, very clear electronic information like uh, cell site location, GPS tracking programs. Even those are voluntarily enabled, so who knows? My two cents. Mark, you spent a lot of your time um, representing providers. And I'm curious to hear your perspective coming from on the ground regarding that. Yeah, I thought I was going to settle the debate between the two Pauls by taking a middle position, but uh, Rosie lost me at the end there, so I, <laughs> I just totally lost me. Uh, I, I get the pleasure of going last, so I'm going to comment on a couple things that were said, and then I'll give my own view on Carpenter. Um, as to David's point about standing, I think it's a complete red herring. Um, standing is not 
gonna, that, that important here because remember, Carpenter is about going to a third party, the phone company, to get data about people. And standing doctrine in the Fourth Amendment is about challenging it after the fact. But here it's the phone company that has to decide, do I, do I produce the data? I argued on behalf of Yahoo in the FISA Surveillance Court of Review in 2008 that Yahoo had standing to assert the you know, interests of itself and its uh, subscribers when it was presented with what we thought was unconstitutional surveillance. The court said, of course we have standing. Microsoft took the Microsoft Ireland case all the way to the Supreme Court before the fact, if surveillance demands, warrants, subpoenas are served on a provider, the provider has standing to challenge it. So we don't have to rely on other people to challenge the doctrine. So I, I don't think the standing is as important as David did. Um, on, on the spreadsheet, it, it is great, but it stops too soon. Because the most creative interpretations of Carpenter came after August 1. Right? In uh, the Fourth Circuit struck down the ability to do computer monitoring of probationers um, in an August 17th decision that was about cited Carpenter. The state of North Carolina Supreme Court struck down satellite-based monitoring of people um, using ankle, ankle bracelets who were not on probation but were registered sex offenders using Carpenter. Uh, to your point about a uh, thing about human anatomy, the court even referenced human anatomy. He said a cell phone m might be like human anatomy, but when you strap a bracelet around somebody's ankle, it is human anatomy. Uh, so so um, I think the spreadsheet needs to continue because I think there are more interesting uses of Carpenter coming along. Okay, what do I think Carpenter does? I think Carpenter gives practitioners like me ammunition. Because you made the comment before about what happens when the government goes to Ring, Fitbit, Ancestry, all my clients. And when they go to those places, yes, the first stop is the district attorney, but the second stop is me and my firm. And we have to think about what does Carpenter mean to us and what should we tell our clients that they can do under Carpenter with regard to objecting to a subpoena for data that we think is covered by Carpenter. So what can they do? What test do we apply? Well, we look back at Carpenter. You said seven things. I think it's four things that the Carpenter decision rested on. Um, it rested on whether the thing that the government is trying to get reveals the privacies of life. Um, the last mile of somebody's GPS location data, where they're going, what they're doing, it reveals the privacies of life. Um, in, is it involuntarily collected? That is, it's collected even when a user is not making a phone call. Is it essential to participating in modern life? Um, and then the length of tracking issue, the duration, is it, is it a sustained period of time? So using those four factors, it is true that very few things will meet all four of them if we think that courts will require all four of them going forward. But maybe courts will require three of them or two of them. And to me, the most important one is reveals privacies of life. Um, does the thing that the government want, uh, wants to receive, does that reveal privacies of life? And is there a basis to say that the user who uh, gave up that data didn't intend it to be distributed freely to third parties? And so today, I was at the Privacy and Security Forum, and we were talking about the mobility data standard and scooters, and how cities around the country are requiring, in order to get a permit, that the scooter companies give a real-time data feed of GPS location to eight decimals of every scooter at all times, and turn that over to the city, or they can't get a permit. And the scooter companies are not in a position to challenge that particularly, because then they won't get their permit, they can't operate scooters. But other people are in position to challenge that, perhaps, and the legislative council of California legislature used Carpenter and CalECFA to say that requirement built into a statute is compulsion under California law and it gets at the very data that's protected by Carpenter and for a variety of statutory reasons said CalECFA uh, bars that type of permitting, although the city of LA said that's not binding on us and we disagree. So I think there's a lot of creative things that are gonna happen using the Carpenter decision and the, the four tests and to try to figure out what data it does apply to outside of location data. But the thing that's much more prevalent than CSLI is GPS. Every app out there is trying to collect GPS either while you're using the app or at all times. Um, you're giving GPS data to a variety of different entities. The scooter is one example, but um, I'm going to the game tonight and SeatGeek wants my location to know, am I near an event where I have a ticket so it can pop the ticket up on the phone and save me time. I'm not sure I love that, but on the other, they're getting GPS if I say yes. So the GPS data is going to be everywhere. Law enforcement is going to be looking for that, and I think we will see a lot more Carpenter objections going forward. We'll make them. Um, and then I think we'll see more decisions, unlike uh, Roberts, where we don't really know exactly why. I think we'll see some decisions where they say privacy of life and involuntarily connected is enough. 
or privacy of life, and duration is enough. And it won't always be for all time the four things. That's my thought. So a middle position, but sure. most of them. Most of them. Yeah. I think in every carpenter panel, it should almost become like a karaoke game where you're asked to recite the factors that you see. I mean, I agree with you, uh, Paul R., that there is a multi-factor test. And as you know, the law is rife with multi-factor tests. And what we rarely have in a multi-factor test, this is what makes law first year of law school so hard, is we rarely have the very first opinion giving you the factors. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there are as many people who've read Carpenter as there are factor tests. The one that I use, again, 32 Harvard uh, Journal of Law and Technology 357, um, is, a, is actually in Robert's second to last paragraph. He says, uh, given in light of the deeply revealing nature of CSLI, its depth, breadth, and comprehensive reach, and the inescapable and automatic nature of its collection, which sounds a lot like Mark's list, but I like that it's in the very last paragraph summarizing the test. Um, I think the other thing, gloss I would add on Mark, what Mark said, I actually agree entirely with what he said, is we also have to remember the different kind of proclivities and freedom to act of appellate federal judges versus district court federal judges versus magistrate federal judges. And so most of what's on the spreadsheet now are at the district court or magistrate judge level you better believe that there are lots of creative Court of Appeals judges who are going to do exactly, I think, what Mark said, which is, hey, when I look at this technology, which, by the way, I also disagree with you. I think there's tons of technologies that fulfill all four of these factors. But they're going to say, you know, factor three is missing a little bit. I'm still going to say that this is a carpenter thing. So I guess, you know, the lesson here is the creativity of the defense bar, the creativity of the providers, the creativity of the prosecutors are going to be risk averse, and then the creativity of the Court of Appeals judges means there's lots of paths to extend carpenter and then we'll wait 10 years to see what Roberts wants to do with it at that point. So. Yeah. I also think, though, along those lines, and obviously I have like the optimist view on it, right? <laughs> like, you look at it, it's like there's so many factors. And I'm like, oh, there's so many factors. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's all about the emphasis. Um, but you know, I, th I think one of the things, and you know, it's something that we see fairly regularly, right, which is uh, there is an education curve where sometimes like those of us sitting on this panel like think about these things and read about all these random things and get into you know technical nuance of this versus that and do they really collect this data what does this data say most people don't live that life right like they just go about life and they're like yeah hey i got on the scooter it's really cool and it got me here real fast and then you say yeah everybody knows who you are they're like what do you mean it like doesn't occur to them that you've now like swiped it with your smartphone to unlock it in your form of payment and it knows it has GPS because obviously they got to go pick it up and it knows you went from here to here at this time and like doesn't even occur to people right and so sometimes it's the scope and the scale and and being able to tell that story that moves both public opinion and judges and like I said you know it's it, you know I agree we're sort of <laughs> really early on um, but I think that some of these things aren't really going to be fleshed out till you get to the appellate level. And we're starting to see, though, in the arguments uh, that we're helping people make, conversations where, you know, like in one particular case, they got in a cell phone, downloaded all the information off the cell phone. They got the warrant to search the phone. The warrant had an affidavit attached that said, you know, that sort of cap in the search saying we're looking for this period of time, these types of things. Somehow that part of the warrant never quite made it to the company that downloads all the information. So they just downloaded everything, right? Because isn't that convenient? The thing about it is, once, the, once we were able to help make the argument where the judge was like, wait a minute, so why did this happen? Why didn't they get that? Oh, we're not, we're not sure why it didn't happen. Is this your practice? Well, it, well, you know, it won't be anymore. Well, you know, so who was responsible for handing this over? And the, you know, the, the prosecutor had to stand there in court and be like, well, it was me, right? Like, that's actually a really powerful thing because sometimes these things happen because they're not revealed, right? Or people don't have the full understanding. But I think as you're able to have these hooks no matter how many tests it is, to start to make these arguments to say, sure, this looks like this for these reasons, and you should know that this thing isn't really just this thing, but it's attached to all these other things, and it works this way. And then something pops up in the news, like, yeah, everybody's sharing everything on Facebook all the time. I'm checked in here. I'm checked in there. I got my face recognition on. And they're like, what, Cambridge Analytica? And, you know, again, for most people, the, the things don't connect. But as we start to sort of tell the story and help connect them, I think particularly in courts and in front of judges, it will start to make a difference. Uh, I'm happy to join your yearly panel, um, you know, but I think that's, that's part of telling the story. Can I make one more observation about what Carpenter does um, related to what you just said, which is that it, it was hard to find uh, privacy in the public sphere before Carpenter, right? The idea was 
But there was third-party doctrine. There was, you know, if you put your face on the street, anybody can, can look at it and see it. You're exposing it to others. Carpenter was like, well, you're exposing some data, but you're not really intending to expose it to everybody, and you really don't have any choice about exposing it, and it exposes a lot, and so maybe it should be protected. But we're about to enter, like, facial recognition everywhere. And we're already seeing laws about license plate readers. And you would think, license plate on a car, that's not a lot of privacy interest, right? I'm, I know that my car is registered. I display the plate in the front and the back. Anybody should be able to read it. But with the technology advances that everybody can read it everywhere at all times and track you, states are passing license plate readers uh, laws that prevent the police from just doing that all the time and prevent companies from um, providing that information to the police. So we're about to enter this world where all vehicles will know where you are at all times. All you know, streets will have facial recognition technology on it. And then we really have to have privacy in the public sphere. It will be a fully surveillance society. And Carpenter is the first, maybe it's not the first, but in my book it's the first one that says, yes, even though you're exposing this data to other people, you can have a privacy interest here. And if Carpenter builds the way Paul thinks it will, uh, Paul O, um, it will get applied in, when we look at facial recognition and license plate readers and tracking your, not just your AV cars, but the cars you, we all drive. Paul, do you, do you think it's privacy? Me. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, but, well, to, so Paul O, but that, that's, so, so Mark, I just noticed that you slipped back into privacy talk again. It's anonymity. Um, and, and, and I think one of the, uh, so there's definitely a privacy thread in Carpenter, um, but I think I'm, I agree with Paul that one of the potential great gifts here is to stop talking about search exclusively in terms of physical intrusion or violations of reasonable expectations of privacy that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable. Um, that, um, and, and start talking about search um, as looking for, trying to find somebody. Um, and of course, if it's in public space, you can look for, try to find somebody in, pu in public space. And so there's not, uh, we don't have to worry about whether you have a reasonable expectation of privacy not, or not. We worry about whether law enforcement are searching for you. Um, and of course, if they're trying to find you, they're searching for you. And that's actually something that's well grounded um, in common law, going back well before the Fourth Amendment, where there, there are scads of uh, judicial manuals from the 18th century that talk about going f magistrates going forward and, and sheriffs going forward and looking for people on public streets and looking for people in public houses. And so getting back to that sort of common sense notion of search, we don't have to talk about privacy anymore and having privacy in public, but rather we can be searched for in public. And that gives us, I think, a much more expansive understanding of our rights um, without having to claim privacy. And the word you didn't say that I was expecting you to say was power, right? So, well, that's, so yeah, this is, I mean, the, I, yeah. th this is my hobby horse, of course. The Fourth <laughs> Amendment is all about gov constraining government power, right. not about protecting privacy. And pri but I'm going to take it incrementally. Yeah, yeah but one, I mean, one thing I've said in some of my writing is we had this funny 50 year period, which just ended, where we realized that privacy was a pretty good proxy for power, that invasions of privacy were those moments when we thought the government had too much power. But the amendment was never about privacy. The amendment was about the kind of, you know, red coats and general warrants and writs of assistance. And I think it's significant. I mean, again, I've read this opinion 50 times, like the tabula rasa. I'm looking for the little tiny, I'm, this is a terrible mixed metaphor, the little tiny time bombs in here that Chief, Chief Justice intentionally or otherwise have planted that will go off in the future. So early on, you know, there's always this early paragraph where they say, oh, here's how we apply the Fourth Amendment, and your eyes glaze over if you're a law student, you just get to the next part. I think the two quotes he chooses are unusual, and they're not always the two quotes. They've, they've appeared before, but not always. One is Boyd, which is not even good law, right? Boyd's and he says, it's, it's a great opinion. <laughs> yeah, it's good, but not great. Wait, you're right. It's great, but not good. That's very good. Um, on this score, our cases have recognized some basic guideposts, right? So here's how you apply the Fourth Amendment. First, the amendment seeks to secure the privacies of life against arbitrary power, right? So it's right there, it's about yeah, power. Yeah, right. And then the second one is Dere, which again is not like usually part of the canon that we cite in these paragraphs. Second and relatedly, a central aim of the framers was to place obstacles in the way of a too permeating police surveillance. I mean, I think that's a profound quote for the chief to kind of surface right at the start of this opinion saying, it's not even about, it's not even about you know, having an efficient police force and our privacy too. It's about affirmatively putting obstacles in front of the cops. It's about forcing the police to be less efficient than the technological modern world would otherwise let them be. And again, I don't want to read too much into these two quotes, but you can make a lot of but, that but second that, quote, that, right? But that's, he's taking from 
Justice Jackson there yes. in the context of right. talking about general warrants. Absolutely. Um, and, that, and that appears at, at the end of the Riley opinion as well. And so you and I, I think alike hope, I, at least I don't want to speak for you, I hope that this is the last time we think of privacy as the touchstone of the Fourth Amendment. Like that's what it's all about. It's about do we have super cops am am uh, amongst our midst and what do we do about it? And if we do have super cops, we can stop them using what the framers have given us. Well, I think there's, there's sort of like the step beyond that too, right? Which is you can have this kind of massive, invasive collection of information on someone that isn't even targeted, right? right? Until the point you decide you're targeting them and then you can like dig back and find it all and construct this whole picture, right? That was part of it. And you go back and like recreate their entire sort of historical field and you never knew you wanted to track them. And so I think that there's some, there's sort of, it's leaving open a lot of not, you know, because they don't want to be embarrassed, you know, future embarrassment with their, their opinion looking too backwards, right? And so I think it's leaving open the recognition. And, you know, he may be, Justice Roberts may be a little, um, I don't think paranoid is the right term. He's obviously focused on these things. You know, he like, did, I was really fascinated by his, uh, the commencement speech he gave at his daughter's school where he's talking about artificial intelligence and all these things, you know, and big data and beware the robots. Like this is, <laughs> you know, I'm not, it's, not, it's not like making this stuff up, but it's obviously very present in, present in his mind in a way to say that like, this is not just the thing in and of itself, right? This is about this sort of comprehensive picture that at any given moment they could decide to focus in on somebody and then go back and recreate it from the way that this information is being collected. And so I think, you know, in some ways it, it Seems like a very messy opinion. In other ways, I think it left a lot of doors open with the understanding that there's going to be, you know, the need to walk through them in the future. And if, if, you, oh, if you don't mind my go fi going fishing um, uh, for, <laughs> for my red herring on that, per <laughs> that precise point, um, is that one of the aspects of standing that I think comes forward from Jones through Riley into Carpenter is a recognition um, that was lost for a while, which is that the person who stands in court stands for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so they're standing there as our representative as and asking for prospective constraints on government power that will guarantee to each of us and all of us a sense of security against threats that otherwise would be present if you grant law enforcement officers unfettered discretion to use a particular means and method. And so what I think we're seeing is uh, we're going to go technology by technology, but one of the central questions in each one of these is going to be scalability. What happens if we say, okay, government agents, you can use this means and method at your own discretion, no constitutional constraints. Um, and, and so somebody's going to come in and st have standing to say, okay, well, I don't want this camera pointed into my backyard. And I think that the constitutional question now is fundamentally, well, what happens if we say no? Um, and the answer to that is that the government could put up a camera that's pointing into your yard and your yard, and we'll have the Chief Justice, a la Jones, saying, you can put up a camera looking into my yard? Well, then no way. Um, and that is an aspect of standing that is present in the, in the Carpenter decision that feeds into the understanding of the constitutional dimensions of the case. That it's not just, not just Carpenter, it's, Everybody, this is the opening line of the decision. There are more cell phones in the United States than there are people. And so he, from the beginning, he's talking about the pervasive threat that is posed if we give law enforcement officers unfettered access to cell site location information. It's everybody. And that is gonna be, I think, one of the big questions that is asked every time one of these new technologies comes in front of a court. Can I but take has a point? Everybody subject to surveillance or is he making a point about the technology capa technological capabilities of the government if you allow access to this data? Right? It, it's it's yes. the tiny constant, maybe both, but yeah. it's the tiny constable in the trunk point. Like, an example came up for me the other day. We were, our Airbnb was arguing against the city of New York about their new um, home sharing rule, which was that uh, every month all the home sharing platforms had to provide all the data of all the transactions that took place that, on the that's platform. That's actually on the spreadsheet. It's on the spreadsheet? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so we were involved in that case, and one of the things the court said in looking at the Fourth Amendment issue is said um, Airbnb had rights, had Fourth Amendment rights, and said no business, in, not in this technology age, would have been forced to turn over all of its custom records, all of its trade lists at any time. It would not have been technologically possible, but now with a push of a button, you can duplicate their entire database, and that's not 
the way it should go. There should be some sort of pre-compliance review, and this didn't provide an opportunity for it. And at a minimum, you have to issue a subpoena to them so they can object. But it was a technological uh, impact of the change that you could just push a button and get the entire customer list that, that motivated the court. And so I was going back to your point. Is it about it was ubiquitous, we're all affected, or is it about look at the power of surveillance if this is allowed and so you can say both? Think, I just so, think so the touchstone is the technology. This is a new, tech, a new means that is potentially at the disposal of law enforcement. And so the question is, do they get unfettered discretion to use that means? Or is there some kind of constitutional constraint on that means? I, I, I just think you guys are all together too optimistic. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you know, you know the Nats are going to win some. Oh, well, that I hope. <laughs> that I, hope. Um, I mean, I, I, I agree that John Roberts is personally deeply skeptical of technology. That's because he's 68 years old and he doesn't understand it. Right? Um, but if you think that John Roberts has been transformed into this anti-governmental power uh, uh, person who believes fundamentally that giving too much information to the government is a bad thing, you've not read the rest of the canon that he's written about. When he gets comfortable with a technology, uh, or he thinks it doesn't apply to him, uh, I'm willing to predict he goes nowhere near this ever again. Uh, you know, Scooters, we were just talking about. He can't imagine himself using a scooter. So he doesn't care. I, 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 I mean, I, I don't know I, for sure, of course, because he hasn't done the case. But, um, but you know, there are now uh, four solid votes to retain governmental authority. Those Gorsuch may surprise us, but he's going to go off on this crazy property theory that, that wouldn't apply to anything that you give up voluntarily by clicking through a consent thing, like the GPS well, no, on your he's app. he's a positive law theory, but not property theory. He used the example that CP&I should have uh, you know, kicked in in this case, is the privacy rules for, for uh, consumer pri proprietary network information. He said CP&I would have been an argument here. You give that up voluntarily, yeah. but there's a special privacy. Yes, he, he, but that's a statutory thing. That's not a, a, right. a, a constitutional not a thing. I don't think he would think of it. I don't think he thinks that anything that isn't property is, 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 is likely protected. I'd be flabbergasted if Gorsuch takes that positive law theory of the Fourth Amendment well, anywhere. But if, I mean, we'll, that, but we'll that, that may but, very well be but, the case. But let me but. share your cynicism on this point, and it's actually the opposite of, of the creativity point that you were making, which is it's the creativity of law enforcement to just ignore the Fourth Amendment. So for example, um, on, on information and belief, there is a practice in many urban centers now for law enforcement officers to show up at the emergency room where a shooting victim is being treated, actively treated, sees that person's cell phone, sees that person's wallet, and search the cell phone on the theory that because this, person, this, because this person has been shot, um, looking at their network will reveal people who are going to go out and, and, and pursue revenge, right? So they're, they're trying to get ahead of the next shooting or try to figure out who the shooting was. Um, but they're just seizing these phones and searching them. Um, and um, based on the conversations uh, that have gone on, the, they don't think that it's a Fourth Amendment event at all. And I, they're just I, like, I, wait I, a second, I, <laughs> there's I, a Supreme I, I Court case. Justice, <laughs> as as um, creative as defense attorneys, uh, and they're going to, I mean, the FBI waited for two years to find a terrorist case that involved encryption. Yeah. Turned out that they didn't find quite a good enough one to, to flip it, but if it had been an active terrorist case instead of a retrospective case, my bet is they, they would have won going away. So they're going to have one of those someday soon and in just about any one of these uh, database things. That's, I mean, I, I mean, contrary to what I may have left you with the impression, of, I actually think that there is a good reason to be afraid of these large scale data aggregation. I just want to ground them not in some sense of the last mile of privacy, because uh, that's a value judgment. I want to try and ground it in some scientific um, or measurable thing, uh, a length of dur a length of it, volume, uh, things that we can define. H how much information does it take for me to be able to infer your location for the next year? Uh, if you make that a measure of it, then that's too much to collect for beforehand. And the answer is, you know, something like a month. And I can infer about 83% of where you're going to be next year. That sounds to me like something much more concrete that I can that a, a judge can hang his hat on and should be hanging his hat on. But it, so long as we have, it seems to me, so long as we have too many standards, right? 
Judges are going to go all over the world on their, on their tests. And the, ultimately, it's going to depend upon five justices on the Supreme Court. And, you know, I mean, you were talking about Ginsburg didn't invite him for what he was, right? I mean, that's realistic. I mean, that's, that's a realistic thing. One change of a vote out of the liberal majority, and uh, Carpenter is a dead letter that gets pounded into the ground uh, because it's not grounded in, in anything that is concrete and measurable. And, and then it'll be 25 years before it can be re revived by the subsequent uh, Buttigieg administration in 2042. <laughs> To go to your concrete and measurable point, I think we have heard some discussion about whether, you know, we were going back to excellent opening remarks by Judge Smith, are there certain types of data that just should be placed beyond the pale? That's very concrete. We could define them type by type where we would just say, even if you get a warrant, it's not enough. And is that something that you consider feasible? Question for the panel. And if so, what, so, what types of those be? Well, we could see it being both, because we're also seeing the emergence now, right, of these sources of positive law that Justice Gorsuch, among others, was concerned about. Um, I think Mark mentioned CalEPA, where we have states that are passing laws that by statute say state authorities have to go and get a warrant, even for types of data that aren't necessarily content, um, but even types of data that are held by third parties that wouldn't necessarily be covered by the Fourth Amendment under, you know, however many fingers you can count to um, on, on, you know, on the court as it is currently composed. But as we also see greater local take up, uptake of interest in particularly invasive forms of surveillance, particularly going back to the point about surveillance in public that can be extremely all pervasive, all encompassing, whether that's license plate readers or facial recognition such as body worn cameras, are there are those some examples for let's take facial recognition as one of them, as something that just needs to be placed, you know, outside of being uh, grabbable over any period of time, warrant or not. Are there things that you think should be beyond the pale, even with a warrant? Juman, I'll start with you. So I would not draw the line that way. And I'll tell you why. It's, it's, I was looking down at myself. I don't know if this is subconscious. You guys probably can't tell. This scarf has camels on it, right? So I think this is, it does. I, you know, I did think about this when I put it on this morning. But I think, you know, to me, I see this more of the ability to sort of get the camel's nose under the tent. And I just say that because I think, you know, to sort of try and draw this one but not that one always sends you down the wrong road. Um, for a lot of reasons, because, you know, if you can't use this one, you really figure out how to use the heck out of this one. And so, like, I don't think that that is the best sort of formulation, but, you know, I have, I, I you know, I'm still going to stick with my optimism, right? Like, yeah, maybe Justice Roberts is not on a lime schooner. It doesn't mean his kids don't ride them or his grandkids won't ride them or, you know, somebody in his family's nieces, nephews, whatever, they're on such and such app and so and so, whatever, and they start to, you know, he cares about more than himself, I would like to think, right? Maybe not me, but his family. And so, you know, I, th I think that there's still, a, you know, a broader perspective on it. So, like, the way I see it, this was the first foray into beyond something concrete, right? Like, there was that, there was, you know, Jones where they're like, no, but they actually trespassed. They stuck something on his car when they shouldn't have done it. And then Riley was like, this is, you know, this is so much not like this analog thing that we have to think about it differently. And this was the first one where we're sort of like out there in a different way. And so maybe, uh, you know, as a decision, did it come through with the clearest, most concrete of like how you draw those lines? No. I think it gave everybody the tools to try and draw those lines. And yes, it's going to be like a period of time where there's a scramble, where, you know, and we've seen it, law enforcement or prosecutors will define it in, like this narrowly. Right? I mean, there's some stuff where they're like, clearly, just like emails, it never got to the Supreme Court. You know, after Warshak, they're like, whatever, email content, we'll just get a warrant. Again, going back to Congress, still can't get them to pass that, right? Which is fairly basic at this point, not, not even like a broader fix. Um, but, you know, like I think there's some pieces where they're like, all right, we've, you know, we'll let that go, we've clearly lost that one. But there's going to be a lot of like fertile ground, and I think that there is, you know, again, rather than sort of trying to go at it from the perspective of this information you just can't have, because like what, my genetics, my DNA, they've got that, <laughs> and they keep finding new ways to get that, or, you know, is it iris scans? Um, you know, they play with that technology. I, I don't, you know, I'm sorry? I, we were trying to, like, iris, iris, iris scans. Yeah. Iris scans. Yeah. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, at some point, like, the, the way they're starting to draw everything together, there are far, there's far more money in developing more and more invasive ways to like data mine and put all these things together than there is in, you know, thinking creatively how to litigate these things. So I think it's much more useful to think about what are the broader, 
what is the way to draw this that makes a clear a clearer line of what the government just shouldn't be able to do, right? So I guess I'm going back to, to their your power argument versus you know the question of is this one thing too invasive versus this other thing. Like I think this is part of progression of a progression that will get us to something that has sort of a more comprehensive floor that says really you just can't go beyond this. Um, you know, but it but it does take time and you know the justices are older than your typical tech user and all of those things are true, but everything is not going to stay here, right? Like the tech will keep developing, the slips will keep happening, the information will keep coming out, people will keep getting angry, Congress will try to pass laws, they probably won't do them very well, and there's going to be litigation around that and having to figure all that out, and I think all of that is going to play into the question of where do we go from here? Better than a, you just can't do this thing. I mean, I love that your question lets me talk about Boyd for the second time in this <laughs> panel, right? So Boyd, 1880-something. Yeah, the, clearly, clearly, uh, you're a huge fanboy of this, uh, fanboy. right? So, so one of the rules that emanates from it is the mere evidence rule. So, warrants can be used to obtain fruits, instrumentality, but not mere evidence. The records kept by a third party. Um, and so, fast forward to kind of liberal lions, uh, Justice Brennan, in one of his first opinions, Warden V. Hayden, right, says, no, 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 the mere evidence rule doesn't make sense. We can use warrants to get mere evidence. But we had this very long period of time where the answer to your question was, yeah, there's certain things you can't get even with probable cause and a warrant. The other case that you made me think of, I think it's, it's been a long time since I taught this case, Winston v. Strawn, which was... That's some, the law firm. Which was... Okay, <laughs> no, no, that's not right. It's Winston v. Someone, which is compelled surgery. Compelled yeah. surgery to pull a body out of a, 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 bullet. a bullet out of a body and the court said it doesn't matter that you had a warrant. That's too much of an invasion in your personhood to allow it with a, with a mere warrant. And so is there something like that in the kind of tech and data realm? Sure, your thoughts, right? And so one thing I love about the Chief Justice's opinion, and I talk about it in my article, Harvard Journal of Law and Technology. Um, <laughs> what was the site? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is that he is engaging in kind of science fiction, what if uh, phenomena throughout this opinion and Riley, right? He's talking about UFOs and Martians and <laughs> rockets to the moon. Um, and so he is kind of liberating us to responsibly be science fiction authors when we think about the near future of the Fourth Amendment. And so if you've looked at the studies coming out of Berkeley and out of an institute in Japan where you put someone in an fMRI machine and you show them a thousand images and you say, think of one of those images, we are now able to recreate the image that they were thinking of. And by the way, this is all in lockstep with research that allows you to do portable fMRI that kind of work, you know, someday at the police station. And so my guess is when that case comes to the court, and that might be 20 years from now, the court's going to say probable cause ain't enough, right? If you are literally probing someone's thoughts, we're going to need something more, or maybe we're just not going to let you do it. Now, maybe not a satisfying answer, because that's not exactly the same thing as saying GPS, but, but I think there, it proves the extreme version that there should be a limit. And it, once we agree with that, then the question is, where do we draw that line? Right? See, I think your question prompts a thought that, that I hadn't had before I was sitting here, so this may be totally offline. But I would have thought that the strongest case for blanket rules against collection uh, or super warrant requirements would be for things that are immutable, like facial recognition, iris, uh, things like that. And I'm trying to put Justice Roberts of Carpenter together with his vote in King versus Maryland, which involved the involuntary collection of DNA from people who, before their conviction, so who were de jure, utter innocence. Um, you know, uh, and, and yet he seemed to have no compunction at all, at least no recorded compunction. He didn't write, right? It was, uh, it was Alito? Alito, I think, who wrote. Yeah. But he voted with him without so much as a buy your leave, saying, you know, we can collect DNA, this immutable thing, and allow the state to create this massive database of DNAs of arrestees, even if, uh, and, and you know, even for minor offenses, traffic offenses, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, now granted it was 5-4, but it seems to me that your question raises very clearly, uh, for me again, uh, the, a skepticism about uh, overreading Justice Roberts's commitment to, to this as an anti-power or anti-technology uh, an anti-power thing, uh, but more as a I don't understand it, so I don't like it sort of thing. 
I, I may be wrong, you know, this, now we're doing psychotherapy, which is, um, uh, <laughs> on you, yeah. but, but, but I, I can't see that John Roberts being really upset with, man, with collections of DNA. But like, but I also, you know, there's the question of can he see himself or somebody in his immediate sphere getting arrested? He's been arrested. I mean, yeah. Well, but I, I don't think he sees it the same way. I mean, I think there's a different idea, you know, frankly, when people think about who is arrested, who's getting their DNA taken. But, but Riley only applies to people who've been arrested. Kind of, but you but also see language in the Carpenter opinion that seems to expand Riley out just more generally. The word generally is actually in there. Sure, but all, all I mean is that the, the empathetic, Justice Roberts' empathetic reach extended to people who had been arrested yeah, so in I, Riley by I, definition. I, I, but yeah, that, that was, the, the King was a Kennedy opinion, and, and rumor, is, rumor is that he, he regretted it almost as soon as it had been submitted. And Justice Scalia, of course, right. wrote that scathing dissent based largely on concerns about governmental power. But, uh, but so I just wanted to answer your, your question. So I, I want to put in a plug for something that is not mine, which is the um, ABA model <laughs> rules for law enforcement access to third party doc documents. Um, and it Gosh, it came out, what, Paul, is it eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight years ago now? Uh, so Luke is five, yeah, so seven years ago. Um, and, uh, and that is a, a really useful, that's a piece of legislation that uh, a legislature could adopt um, that sets incrementally higher hurdles of access to different kinds of information based on assessments of the privacy interests. And so it's not something, it, it, it's a really interesting document for a number of different reasons. One is that it really takes seriously this idea of gradations of privacy interest. Um, but two, it, it imagines a whole set of different kinds of prospective remedies um, that put different levels of constraint on government actors. So sometimes they just have to have a considered internal conversation about it and say, yes, we agree as an office we're going to do this. Sometimes they need to get a super warrant. And there are a number of different, different places along that, at that range. Um, and so it doesn't directly answer the, is there anything that's beyond the pale, but it does suggest that, that as legislatures try to deal with the potential fallout of Carpenter, if they can get their acts together, um, that there is at least a model out there for setting different levels of constraint on government actors based on the kinds of information um, that, they're, that they're seeking. Uh, and uh, now I'll plug something of mine. So I have an article coming out in SMU that actually deals with uh, among other things, mind readers, mm -hmm. but it's about um, encryption and whether uh, we have a fourth, fifth, or common law right to robust, unbreakable encryption to the extent such a thing actually exists. Um, and because uh, that's sort of the unsettled question coming out of San Bernardino is whether we actually have that right to, in to encryption. So what's the connection to mind reading? I can, I can find your code through the mind reader. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so, so the idea is that right now our biological systems uh, render our thoughts largely inscrutable. Yeah. And so what would happen if there was a mind reader? And I think uh, probably on at least Fifth Amendment grounds that would not, we wouldn't be allowed to use to, to break our biological encryption well, process. So that's another great example because the doctrine as it's developing is that mind reading is, is bad. Uh, but I can force you to put your thumb on the on the phone to unlock it because that's just a bio that's not testimonial in the Fifth Amendment. So that's another one of those things where I would have thought that it, besides being a better, uh, you know, almost all experts agree that biometrics are better for encryption than mm -hmm. than passphrases. Um, you know, this is you know I can change what I'm thinking. I can't change my thumb. Not yet. <laughs> Mark, I want to hear from you because you both You're seem to have some, some responses to Paul and Paul here, but also <laughs> because you are in the business of representing the companies that are inventing the future, that are inventing science fiction. And for the sort of various tests that we've proposed, whether it's an escalating you know, level of intrusiveness in state power, whether it's particular types of data, where does that leave you as somebody who tries to represent providers who necessarily are coming into the picture prior to the you know, prosecution and suppression phases? Right. So. When I was listening to that last conversation, I was thinking every time we have a super warrant requirement of some sort, it's statutory. It's not been constitutionally based, except perhaps with the surgery case. So the, you know, a sneak and peek warrant has to be done differently because it's a different method of collection, but it's statutory based, and so is the, so is the Title III is statutory based about what you have to show. So I, I don't know that providers have a view on that they have a piece of data that's beyond the pale constitutionally. Um, but providers are looking for statutory protections and, and invoking statutory protections more than they're invoking constitutional 
protections. And so just as a matter of practicality, it seems like we'll have more success with the cal -ECPA type approach um, to protect providers' interests than we will trying to find it beyond the pale constitutional doctrine. So, so I want to be clear. I was answering uh, occasions where we would not allow the police to right. do it at all. Exactly. So if the question was, should things be subjected to super warrant requirements and should we do it statutorily or constitutionally, I would have had a very different answer. Um, and this has been my hobby horse well, that's for- That's the only question I can't answer. Yeah. No, no, but for, for a number of years, I've argued that given the state of technology, I mean, this was a very Carpenter-esque thing to say, but this was before Carpenter, the and I think this is David's first answer on this panel, the judges need to reach deeper into the toolkit of super warrant requirements, and they have done it constitutionally twice, right? Let's not forget that Burger v. New York, which I teach to my students as the most important Fourth Amendment case that came out in 1967, right? Far more important than Katz, was all about what the Constitution required when it came to assessing the like fine details of the New York statute, the wiretap statute. And out of it, they basically gave a roadmap to Congress that ended up in Title III. And then you get Ju Judge Posner in the 80s who said, you know, Title III applies to voice recording. It doesn't apply to silent video. But I'm going to squint and look at it sideways and think about my constitutional duty and, and export Title III to silent video. Awesome. And so my argument to judges is, let's unleash the hounds. Let's do this everywhere. Let's do this with you know, forced decryption. Let's do this with government hacking. Uh, let's do this when uh, we're going to do warrants like we did in the playpen case, where we send you know, a, a virus to 8,000 computers around the globe. In every one of those cases, I want the judges to feel empowered without waiting for Congress to say, you know what, this is not enough. All you have is probable cause. Come back when you have a time limit, when you have necessity, when you have minimization. It's going to take a while to, to make the judges confident enough to do that, but that's, that's something I've been pushing for a while. Yeah, there is one more thing I wanted to yeah. say in response to your question, though, which is that providers are a little schizophrenic on some of this stuff, right? The, the beauty of providers always defending warrant for content is that this law prohibited them from doing anything with that content anyway. So it was a piece of data that they could treat as absolutely sacrosanct and then push back on law enforcement when they wanted it. When you develop a carpenter-like theory, which is that so is this location data, well, providers do things with the location data. And arguing a pure, this is, you know, this should be beyond the pale makes it hard to do business. So, you know, they're not all going to jump on board depending on what they do with extending the protections to certain types of data if it means they can't use it um, in a way they want to. So it's, it's, a, it's not entirely, you know. Right. Well, this seems to be the other thread that is tricky that the justices, both in the majority and in the dissents, are struggling with in Carpenter is how to apply the, the property theory here. We've been talking mostly about some of the cats, reasonable expectation stuff, and we've been talking mostly on privacy and the creation of privacy interests, whether judicially or by statute. But is there grounds for expanding property interests through the positive sources of law that Justice Gorsuch says he wants to see, such as more statutes. We kind of are seeing this with the GPR, for example, with the California Consumer Protection Act, where it seems to be creating rights and information that is collected, generated, held, or as business records by third parties. Is that something that's going to be workable? Will that help us to bolster or expand Carpenter? David, you're shaking your head. Oh, I just think that the positive law approach to the Fourth Amendment is wrongheaded on a num for a number of different reasons um, and has been de facto rejected by the Supreme Court. And I'm going to flail on remembering the name of the case. Um, but it's a Scalia opinion dealing with an individual who is posing as a law enforcement official. Um, and, uh, and in that opinion, Justice Scalia talks meaningfully about the fact that we have to, we, we're not going to recognize state law grounded Fourth Amendment rights because that gives us a, a patchwork, a Fourth Amendment patchwork nationwide. So if we recognize this positive law theory of the Fourth Amendment, then Californians have different Fourth Amendment rights than we do sitting here in DC than I do when I go home to Maryland. Um, and that just can't be the way that, the fe that federal constitutional rights operate. They can't be dictated by state statutes, nor can they be dictated by legislation because then what Congress giveth, Congress can taketh away in terms of our constitutional rights? That doesn't sound right to me. So I'll, I'll just, since everybody's plugging something, if you come to the privacy and security forum tomorrow, the panel I'm on is privacy is property right, right? And, and to give you the short version, uh, it's a great idea that is utterly unoperationalizable. Uh, for one thing, if we define property um, 
in, a, in some kind of constitutional way as Gorsuch might want to do or as some of the others might want to do, then it's going to apply to all of Mark's uh, clients as well in some form or another. And if we defy, we, and it's going to be a really weird world in which we give you property rights as in privacy as against only the government but not as against Facebook or, or Yahoo or somebody like that. And then there's absolutely no way, um, at least that I can see right now, to scale it up so that uh, your, pro your property preference, you can sell your property rights for X dollars and you go, you'll sell this bundle, but you won't sell that and she'll sell a different bundle of things that she wants for a different price because she values her privacy much more or less and she just wants free stuff. You know? So it, it's almost impossible to imagine uh, the, de the ready development of a commerce in privacy since we have no way of valuing it in you know, monetized terms. Your hedonic preference is totally different. One thing we haven't talked about, which what that raises, is the issue of consent. I mean, the surgery would have been fine if the patient had consented to it. And what the law enforcement creativity arguments these days are is like, well, the providers of whatever it is got some form of consent, and we can water ski behind that consent and say it's consent for the government. And um, there, there's reasons not to do that and precedent not to do that. But there are places, and Warshak is one of them, where the, where the judge said, no, that's not sufficient consent for law enforcement to go in. But some of these consents will be a little more robust mm -hmm. and a little more uh, expansive and maybe uh, I don't know that there is anything you can put beyond the pale if there's consent it's just is that consent freely given and you get back to those, some of those questions that's, the doorbell question. Question. that's the what that's the doorbell question. But I mean that's also the question of what do people actually understand they're consenting to right like I, I, I always try to pull it back when I sit here because you know if I were to just walk out of here and go stop some people on the street and talk to them about these like mind reading machines they'd be like and this girl's crazy. Like, I don't know where she came from. She clearly needs some medica her medication. You know, like, it, that would be the reaction. It would be a natural reaction, right? And so, like, I was just talking to somebody about the fact I've got kids in elementary school, and we show up at whatever is your, like, the day where you go and you meet the teacher and stuff, and they're like, well, we use these apps to communicate with the class. And one teacher uses one app, and then the teacher at the other school uses the other app, and then there's, like, a third app for something else plus the app for baseball, so you know where the games are in the practice zone, the app for soccer. And, and some of like, well, they're like, well, did you read all the privacy process? I said, no, because you know, like, this is the only way I'm going to hear from my kid's teacher or like, know what's coming up, and so what do you do at this point? Like, number one, who has time to read all of those? And number two, like, realistically, when everything is so tied in, then you know, I think we're back to a place where is consent meaningful. And I think you know, part of what happens is, it, it is, by the way, state and, and local legislators are moving <laughs> better frankly, than the federal government, and they're not moving well on anything these days. But, you know, there's also a question of things that are, are smaller or less controversial, like making these things understandable to people, like making the privacy policy understandable, making the kinds of things that are being collected understandable to people, right? Like in an easy, digestible form, not one where, like, you know, somebody like me would pick through it and be like, did you read this thing? It must mean that, and I bet it's, you know, like, that's not, that's not going to fly. And so I think there's, yeah, there, there has to be uh, you know, a place where we're just talking about what is uh, digestible for the consumer, for the end user, right? in a way before you start talking about what is consent and, and how consent could even figure into anything. Um, so I, I'm reminded of a quip from Larry Lessig when he was talking about some libertarian where he said, you know, Ayn Rand is the kind of thing that most people encounter when they're in high school and you get really enamored and then you work your way out of it. And you, for some reason, I've never worked your way out of it. I feel like that describes Neil Gorsuch and this property theory, which I'm totally, with. It's, it'll be fascinating as a scholar to watch him struggle with it on a couple of opinions before he just gives up on it for the reasons that have been highlighted. I, I, was, I was at the oral argument and I remember, I think it was Souter sits right next to him and I remember Souter saying, yeah, keep asking questions about your property theory. This is great. Not Suter, I'm sorry. You're, I'm showing you tonight that my memory is failing now that I'm like, like, Winston V. Lee was the name of the opinion. Anthony Kennedy wrote the thing. Justice Souter was not on the court after he, uh, he retired. The, um, but, but I remember it was, it, it was the other white guy. I remember Bri the other white liberal. I remember Breyer was egging him on saying, this is, yeah, do more. And I imagine, I talked to my students the next day, I imagine he went right, Gorsuch went right back to Chambers and he pointed at some poor unlucky clerk and he said, look, there's this Section 222 CPNI section. Go write that up. Make that work. And the clerk came back repeatedly, because if anyone in the room has ever dealt with CPNI, you know what a kind of terrible and vague and poorly written provision it is. 
And I'm sure that the court gave him draft after draft saying, does this do it? Does this do it? And ultimately, you get this terrible opinion. It's actually a lovely opinion for the first two thirds. And you get this terrible ending where he, where he basically says, well, I'm not going to encounter CPNI because it was raised for the first time in front of us, so they forfeited the argument, which of course was not necessary. I mean, there was tons of briefing about CPNI on both sides. Um, but the CPNI part just wouldn't write. It just would not write. And that's the problem with Gorsuch's property as whatever positive law says property is. So I think he's just going to abandon it. I also think, and I've heard a lot of people say this, this isn't original to me, that if there were only four votes in the majority, Gorsuch would have provided the fifth. Now, we'll never know how he would have reasoned his way to it, but he was not going to be the reason that this you know, rule ended up the way, uh, the opposite of what it did. So, so that's idle speculation, but I really do believe that we just got to kind of humor Gorsuch for a while, and at one point he's going to pick a side, uh, and I hope he picks the right side. Was there, is there grounds for continuing down the, the my, my problem with the, both the consent and the property theories is that it seems like it holds less and less force in an era where you don't own records anymore, you license all of your files, if you have them at all, rather than streaming them. You ride in somebody else's car, you know, in an Uber and a Lyft, you have no idea if there is one of these black box recorders on board or not. So it seems like, you know, as, con as consent expands into this, this realm of things that we don't even own or have any meaningful control over, are we going to have to have a reimagining that might even play into this kind of uh, you know, Luddite like fear of technology that you mentioned, um, where we have to reimagine this entirely on the basis of the technological advances in order to get back to that, uh, I hate to invoke it, but the equilibrium adjustment theory that Orrin Kerr likes to, to talk about, where consent becomes effectively meaningless in a world where as the court said in this opinion, there becomes less and less voluntariness about participating in this technological mediation of every aspect of life. Consent has always been effectively meaningless. I feel more confident than I do about Car Carpenter in predicting that coerced consent will never be the sole ground. You know, you've got people flying on airplanes who say it's coerced consent to make them go through TSA. They lose every time. You've got people who are stopped uh, in car stops who say it's coerced consent to open up their trunks because the guy says, okay, don't open up the trunk. We'll wait an hour till the drug dog gets here. You've got um, Hobbes, Hobbesian choices, Hobbes, Hobbesian choices, Hobbes, um, everywhere that you encounter government. And uh, it is probably the single most core fundamental way in which government manages its interactions with, with citizens in a way that drives you to allow them to do whatever it is they want to do. So I feel absolutely comfortable in, in the prediction that it will never be the case that that will be the only one of the factors that comes out of a case and, and, uh, and somebody in a magistrate position says, well, you, know, you, 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 uh, you clicked through the app and there's a consent there, but you didn't mean it because you, don't, uh, you had to have your Fitbit or your ring. Yeah, there's, that's just never going to be the case. Wait, I, I don't quite see what you're saying. I can't follow which side you're coming on because involuntarily collected was one of the things in Carpenter. It, it was one of the things. It will never be the sole thing. It will never be the sole thing. It will never be the only factor pulled out because it's everywhere that, the, that you talk to the police or any government agency for that matter because they always give you this, this false choice. And if we actually meant what we thought about the involuntariness of consent, you would be allowed to... Uh, drive away from a traffic stop. You would be uh, allowed to refuse to go through TSA if you were willing, uh, metal detector, uh, uh, or, or fly anonymously. That was the Gilmore case. Um, yeah, it's but, just not the case. Th but the question, I think, isn't whether involuntary consent is the sole thing. It's a question of whether consent, which usually trumps everything and gets you out of some of these questions, will do that when it is involuntary consent. And, and I think Carpenter says, it, it, it won't, right? You could have said, well, they consented to give this information to the phone company, and therefore we ignore everything else. I, but and I don't think only, it's going to... Only in circumstances I submit in which it, it is actually uh, part of your anatomy, right? Because if you really take that to be the case, right, that, the, that consent that's coerced by withholding of a service is, co is, is, is invalid, then... I can't be forced to uh, uh, get on an air. I can't be uh, forced to consent to flying without showing identification. Yeah, I can't be let's forced. Let's get back to facial recognition. You could say you consented, have your face shown, you walk down the street. But I don't think that's going to 
rule the day that we all have consented to facial recognition because we walk down the street. So I, I hear what well, you're saying. We, that we, it won't be close well, as, as, as the database showed, well, CCTVs have uniformly, well, with one odd exception that looked like it, there were strange facts, been approved already. Now, granted, that's not CCTV linked to uh, 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 fr uh, uh, real time facial recognition, but I guarantee you that all that CCTV is linked to post event facial recognition, a la post terrorism uh, deconstruct uh, forensic evidence of who who left the bomb in the London uh, underground. So there's never going to be a, a sense in which the London bomber is going to say, I didn't consent uh, because it was coercive, uh, and he's going to be able to suppress the facial recognition technology that pulled him out of the 10,000 hours that they scanned within a half day in London. And I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I just can't imagine that uh, any court, even, even the most liberal justices on this court, you know, going in that direction and, and buying that as a route. Variations of things, right? One is the stuff that you choose to go out and get because it makes your life convenient, right? Like, I'm going to Fitbit, I'm going to count my steps, I'm going to do whatever, I'm going to put the ring on my door versus the things you can't get out of anymore. I was trying to explain this to my drive. I have a really old Subaru. They last forever, so I think it's going to be around for a while. But, like, what happens when that car finally dies, right? Like, how many old cars can you buy before you're just in the reality where your car has, you know, all these various systems, black boxes, GPS, everything else? You can't get another kind of car, right? Like, you just, you can't. And so there's, you know, it's a different thing between saying, like, I really want to, like, hook up my house with every kind of, you know, smart appliance and, you know, sit here on my phone and turn down my thermostat and turn on the oven and do whatever. Like, those are things that, there's a, you know, it's, it's, there's a scale of where are you consenting or where are you choosing versus where do you just not have another option? I'm just not going to take, what, I'm just not going to drive a car, so then I'm going to take Uber, then I'm going to take... Well, I mean, you could say that. Sure, I could live without flying. What does that mean? That means I have a whole lot of family I'm not going to see unless so like, I book so a ship that's, overseas. So that's one of those cases where you would, you would think it was one of the essentials like this. But the flying public has no rights against, uh, against TSA's but warrantless searches. There, it's like you can what? drive places, at least if you're going continentally. I, I, yeah, so well, I don't know about you, you but I can't drive to London, right? But that, no, I, said, I said it depends yeah. if you're going continentally. And so for the majority of the flying public, they're not necessarily going overseas or having family, like, it, you know, it's, it's, it's all different. There's not like one set of circumstances in that case. I think flying, they've just sort of made the bargain that it's too important to keep people safe, right? That that's just gonna go across the board. But when it comes to other things, it's not as clear at this point. And I think that there is gonna be, um, there can be incidents on both sides of the tipping point, right? Like I think there's always the really tragic circumstance that's the tipping point, and sometimes there's just the really huge breach that's the tipping point. Where there's, you know, they're suddenly like, well, how did they get all of these people's photos up online? Or how did they get something that sort of turns the imagination in a different way? And I think, you know, unrelated to these issues, we've seen those kind of external events shape probably, you know, how court decisions went, even if nobody says it out loud. And I think it can go both ways, you know, even with these, with these questions. So we only have a couple minutes left, so I want to wrap up by just going straight down the line, one to two sentences each, you know, control yourselves. What's the, next, what's the next case we're going to see in front of the Supreme Court that deals with Carpenter? Oh, that wasn't the question I thought you were going to ask me. So that my, my canned answer was going to be, it is a wonderful time to be a law professor <laughs> writing in this area. Uh, and I, I think we're either going to see real time or tower dumps. And, um, and I, real time, I think we know where it's going to go. Um, tower dumps, who knows? So yeah, I don't have a lot different to say. This is not like the best wrap up answer, um, but to say, you know, hit up our website. <laughs> We've got motions, we'll help you out. I think, so David said my answer, so I'll add a couple. I, every single opinion cited Warshock uh, positively. So it, it seems like if you're willing to count noses, one holding that flows from this case is you need a warrant to read email. Now it's hard to get that to the Supreme Court because that's the practice that kind of how we've interpreted the Stored Communications Act anyway. But it seems like there's a clear signal to the defense bar that if they can find a way to get that to the court, that they're going to get. That's actually broader to like the content, right? Not just email. But content. I mean content. I mean well, content. Right. But right. I mean, I think that's how you broaden it out, right? It's the question of text yeah. messages or other kinds okay. of messaging but apps. I think that'll be an extension of Carpenter before too long. Yeah. Really I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it in a different direction and say I think it's going to be a facial recognition slash CCTV case. Um, not CCTV pure, but linking that to some form of, of, of technological identification. Mark. 
It's going to be a search against the DNA databases. I think the government, you know, just came out with a new policy, says that they're only, the federal government, you're only going to search the DNA beta databases if the terms of service say, this is their interim policy, terms of service say it's okay for law enforcement use, which not that many say, but states don't have that prudential restriction. I think we're going to see, is it a search to compare a string of DNA against all the DNA in the database? Is that searching everybody's DNA or is that, um, is that something like, so I think it's DNA. Okay. No, no. Well, we'll see who's right and, you know, loser has to buy the other's dinner is what I'm <laughs> going to say. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us this evening. I want to wrap up and give people who need to go and see the Nats game an opportunity to, to get out of here and then we'll open it up um, for anybody who's still left after that uh, to, to ask some questions of, of our panelists. So thank you all very much. Go Nats. Next. All right, go Nats. have a mic, but I guess this is a small room. You can just shout loudly if anybody has a, has a question. You can keep going. Yes. You're going to need to have your ID, your driver's license, go to another different institution and have it engineered. And again, the private inspector will check it because it just works in the first place that um, a company may say that has a file that you know, need to file things as well. So I don't think there's going to be any issues. So the two answers to that question. Paul to pick up, but the, the two answers to that question. One, so the Fourth Amendment just doesn't cover private parties, except one of the huge gaps in the majority opinion in Carpenter is who conducted the search? Um, and when was the search? What exactly was the search? Um, and that highlights a requirement for any Fourth Amendment challenge, which is that a state agent has to have conducted the search. And that is just something that is completely missing. Um, but what almost has to be true in Carpenter is that the phone company was a state agent when it was gathering that cell site location information because they knew that government agents are interested in that information. They knew that government agents, oh, Mark left, routinely ask for that information. Um, and electronic companies know that Google knows that the government asks for this kind of user information tens of thousands of times a year. Um, and so for purposes of the Fourth Amendment, Amazon, if it's getting hit with government requests for that data, arguably is a government agent and well, is subject to Fourth Amendment constraints. It's funny, I don't read it that way at all. Um, I read it like they did more violence to the old state action doctrine in the Fourth Amendment, which is maybe why you don't want to read it that way. The, the search was the moment they delivered the data pursuant to the D order. That was the traditional state action. That was the handing over the information. And then they've got this weird retrospective examination of the data. Remember, it wasn't, they didn't like probe why the phone company did it the way they did it. They just said, we're going to study the database. I mean, they said that more than once. Um, and so I, I just, I, I agree they completely upended their approach to state action, but I think they just almost threw it out. And they just said, it's not state action until the government asks, but right when they ask, we, we in this very odd way look at the result of lots of private choices. So again, I, it, maybe it's angels on the head of the pin, which way they go, but they did something weird. I agree with you there. My, the optimism I had on this panel would have been 
completely the opposite if this were a panel about Amazon's power, <laughs> right? Where we don't have a carpenter, and I don't see any prospect of a carpenter, and I don't think the CCPA or the GDPR or anything else that's looming does anything that we need to kind of recalibrate our relationship to corporations. No, oh, I yeah. Think, I think the question there would be in all the tools and devices that Amazon is developing specifically for law enforcement and offering to them for free, and then how that starts to bleed into the other information they're collecting and what they do with it. Like, I, 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 am, I am really skeptical about Amazon. Um, I don't think that they're, you know, really like segregating their databases and saying like, oh, hey, law enforcement, we created this tool for you to use, this face recognition, this other, you know, kind of data monitoring tools, et cetera, et cetera. But we're keeping it totally separate and apart from this massive amount of information we're collecting on people. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical that that's the case. And so I think that those are the places where you, that sort of separation starts to blend, I guess, or bleed. Other, other audience questions? Yeah. So, uh, hey, uh, my name is Drew Sommer. I'm also a former police officer and a police reporter. Uh, Professor Gray, uh, you, you mentioned something that I found very curious that you uh, talked about in your sort of last interview. Uh, you made the assessment of, of ER to be having a phone sex by police, which is not allowed. Um, so I think I'll, I'm, I'm only willing to go as far as upon information and belief. Um, is that happening in New York? It, 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 it is happening um, in several cities in the United States where it appears that law enforcement officers are routinely seizing phones from gunshot victims, yes, and, and searching them. Is this like an exigency justification? Um, it, the, the small end of direct experience I have with actual justifications is that it never occurred to them that this was something that was covered by the Fourth Amendment. Right. And, but now it's become like a big, it, it's how part of their. And so I'm not sure that they are, but they're not giving the phones back. Um, and, 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 and at least on some occasions, they're just putting just somebody's thumb on the phone. Yeah, the they're just putting somebody's thumb on the phone. Yeah, yeah. and locking them. That's gonna be our next. <laughs> well, but that, that's, I, I, so there's a pretty strong consensus that, that compelling somebody to decrypt their phone with their thumbprint is not a Fifth Amendment event um, because there's no expressive content to mm -hmm. that action. Um, and so that's... But there's been some but traction there too. There, there, yeah, but, but yes, yeah, so the, the, but part of the point is that law enforcement officers, even in pretty well settled areas of the Fourth Amendment, don't necessarily feel constrained um, particularly if they're not worried about the admissibility of that evidence mm -hmm. in the future, right? So, so they they want to try to get into the these shoot these gang networks and identify potential future shooters, potential future victims, and they're not much concerned about whether evidence might be suppressed later on. And we saw that also with uh, cell site simulators, where government agents were freely using cell site simulators. Um, not ever concerned about the Fourth Amendment because they were just not going to use that evidence itself um, in the future. They were going to use it to develop uh, in the lines of investigation, and then they would worry about the Fourth Amendment once they got to the point of gathering evidence that they wanted to be admissible at trial. That goes back to your point, and that's probably also Tamana's point, about where suppression is really the only effective remedy that we have in order to try and provide some slap on the wrist to keep you know, police officers from doing these kinds of warrantless searches. To the degree that there's never going to be that that suppression is not going to come up, or there's not going to be standing to challenge it because they're not doing it in order to get admissible evidence in this particular person's case, there's not going to be a whole lot that we can do about that in that in that situation. And this did also come up. Um, Steve was talking about the uh, the black box recorder cases, where we also have seen um, police officers, at least in the Georgia case, just you know thinking that there's absolutely no problem with going in with no warrant at all, getting into somebody's car, which entails the property interest, and just pulling and dumping the contents of the, the data off the black box recorder, uh, the event data recorder from their car as well. So it is an interesting illustration of the creativity that Paul was talking about, uh, uh, not even needing to think actually creatively about what the legal ramifications are for using the data that is out there. But if, you know, if you collect it, they will come. Um, whether they get a warrant or not is sort of for the Supreme Court to tell 15 years hence. Um, I, I just wanted to plug for, we have copies of the champion out there. We did an issue on um, a lot of these sort of digital criminal law questions. So it's got articles, including one on using your privacy policies as a way of creating a property right in your data. Um, 
and face recognition and other things, but they're out there. Uh, normally you have to be a member to get the champion, so you can pick up your copy for free. Um, well, I want to wrap up, make sure we end on time, get everybody out of here. Um, but one more thank you to our panelists. Thank you for coming out and talking about this tonight. Thank you.